Supervisors, it is now 7 o'clock. I call to order this regular meeting of the Eau Claire County Board of Supervisors on this Tuesday, October the 5th. Uh, in place of the honoring, uh, in, I'm sorry, in place of the moment of reflection, we're going to have a moment of silence, uh, which I will introduce. First, we will have an honoring of the flag. Supervisors, please unmute. And together, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We're going to. Nick, our, our agenda says that Dr. Schneider, Schneider has. Someone who resembles. Right, I realize that, but I believe Dr. Schneider is aware of this change. Is that correct, Dr. Schneider? Yes. Good. Okay. So, my fellow supervisors, we pause this evening in honor of and in memory of Supervisor Ray Henning, our colleague, who passed away this past Sunday. Ray served on this board for more than 19 years. During those 19 years, we could rely on Ray to be an active presence at every board and committee meeting, to be ready to listen, to think critically about any issue, and to be very direct and honest in his opinions, respecting others, but giving his blunt and honest assessment. Ray did not, in the words of St. Paul, suffer fools gladly. As his wife, Joey Henning has said, you always knew where he stood. On a committee on administration, Ray was a steady voice and added balance to the committee. As chairperson of the Highway Committee, Ray worked tirelessly to ensure that our citizens had the best road system possible. In the winter, when snow plowing is so critical, and other times of year, as we tried to improve our county roads and bridges. Less well known is Ray's work on the board of the Chippewa Valley Innovation Center and on the local emergency planning committee, where he had to work especially hard during the past two years. Perhaps least known is Ray's work on the landfill committee. Ray was a lifelong resident of Altoona and owned and operated a number of businesses in the community. He worked for the U.S. Postal Service for 38 years, operated a bar and grill in Altoona for 28 years, and owned and operated a trophy and engraving business for 45 years. He served on the City Council of Altoona for 10 years, was a member of the Lions Club for 50 years, and was active in a number of community organizations. Ray did not draw attention to himself, but we definitely knew he was there and his influence will remain with us. Let us now spend a moment of silence in honor of and in memory of our colleague. Thank you, supervisors. Next on our agenda is call of the roll. Clerk McDonald. Gibson. Present. McKinney. Present. Knight. Here. Pagonis. Here. Anton. Here. Zook. Here. Wilson. Here. Supervisor Stell just said he would be absent tonight. Um, Maori. Here. Coffee. Here. Bates. Here. Russell. Here. Gatlin. Present. Meyer. Here. Hambuck Boyle. Here. Neiman. Here. Dunning. Here. Wilkie. Here. Anderson. Present. Beckfield. Here. Schneider. Here. Leary. Here. DeLuca. Here. Jansen. Here. Rothnagel. Here. Roberts. Here. Frank. Here. And Christofferson. Here. We have 27 present, one absent. We do have quorum. Thank you. 
Next item on our agenda is the journal approval of the Journal of Proceedings from September the 21st. The chair looks for a motion. Eckfield so moves. Eckfield moves. McKinney second. McKinney seconds. Thank you. Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections to the Journal of Proceedings? I hear none. We will do this by voice vote. Please unmute. All those in favor of approval of the Journal of Proceedings of <laughs> September 21st, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed by nay. It is unanimous. Thank you. Next is public comment. Do we have any public comment, uh, Samantha? Well, there was no public comment submitted for this meeting. Okay. Is there anyone online? Who wishes to present public comment? Second call. Is there anyone online who wishes to present public comment? Third and final call. Is there anyone online who wishes to present public comment? I hear none. We will re we will move on now to reports to the county board under 2.04.320, beginning with the oral reports. From the health department, an update by uh, Director Liska Gisi. Liska. Thank you, Chair Smyer, and thank you to the county board. Um, it seemed like a good opportunity today to give a brief update on what's happened. Excuse me, Liska. There, no Liska, there seems to be a problem with your microphone. I'm not sure what the problem is, but you're a little mm -hmm. fuzzy. Okay, I will up. try again. I'm breaking up. Okay. Yeah. I let Catherine know I was having a bit of an internet problem. I'm going to turn my video off and we'll try that. And okay. My apologies if that doesn't work. Um, is this audio better? It's better. It's better. Yes. Okay. My apologies. Um, so it seemed like a good opportunity to provide a brief update to you about COVID-19 in Eau Claire County. And also answer questions if the, the board um, felt that was important. Um, do know that our health department and our collaboration across the community continues with COVID-19. Um, we have case numbers that continue to be very high. Um, the last number of weeks they have been. Not something that we were anticipating at this level, but we are now at 14,450 positive cases of COVID-19 in Eau Claire County and 120 deaths. Um, yesterday, for example, we had 86 positive cases and that's been um, in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80 numbers per day. Our average for the last seven days has been 57 cases per day. So we're at the levels that we were um, last year when, um, when we were having challenges last January. The CDC and the state consider us in high transmission as is the rest of Wisconsin at the moment. Our largest group that is um, having positive cases right now is that under 18 year old age group. And we are seeing disease spread in um, in that population. Some of it school related, some of it family related and activity related, but we definitely see positive cases in that group at the moment. Um, hospitalizations and deaths are also significant. Um, again, much better because we have um, vaccination that has happened. Again, our vaccination rates in Eau Claire County are just below 55% of Eau Claire County residents are fully vaccinated for COVID-19. Um, our 65 plus age group is at 85%, which is good news. Um, and the data across Wisconsin clearly shows that individuals that are fully vaccinated are much, much less likely to be hospitalized and to die from COVID-19 at this point. Um, the tough news in Eau Claire and as well as across the state is that our increases in our fully vaccinated percent are going very, very slow the last number of weeks. So we have not gained much in the last couple of weeks, although there's been a lot of effort to vaccinate. 
a couple of those updates just for your awareness and then again I can answer questions. We um, we have had to ramp up our disease investigation team pretty considerably in the last few weeks. So that has happened. We um, over the last four weeks have trained additional staff to do that work after having not needed them for many, many, many months. Um, we have um, worked with the National Guard and the region to start a testing location at Jacobs Well. That was operational a couple of weeks ago and is running now Saturdays, Mondays, and Thursdays. That site is for testing for PCR testing and is a free location at Jacobs Well. Soon, we hope that that site will also be a regional vaccination location for both um, people that need their first series, but also those that are eligible now for boosters, as well as any potential expansion for younger age groups. So that location will continue um, at least for testing and possibly for vaccination. We also have lots of vaccination opportunities tonight at the courthouse. I just left the building um, at 6.30, quarter to seven, and we were vaccinating. We do every Tuesday at the courthouse. Um, we also have mobile vaccination happening, particularly to work with populations that may have significant barriers across the county. So that does continue. Um, and we are working with all of our partners that are vaccinating, as well as testing to try and coordinate that across the county. And that includes healthcare, pharmacies, um, UW Eau Claire, and many others. My ask of all of you to stay informed is we do do a weekly situation report that is on our website. It is a weekly update on some basic data, some basic updates. Please do um, review that as a way to get some basic information. And then our website really is our spot to as much as possible provide um, information for the community as well as obviously policymakers. So with that, I know that was a lot and quickly stated, but certainly available to answer questions. Uh, supervisors, let's use raised hands because I cannot see the faces of all the participants. So uh, please uh, raise your hand. I'm electronically raise your hand if you have a question or comment. And I will monitor that. Uh, Supervisor Christofferson, followed by Supervisor Dunning. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Lisa Gisi, for all your work. I know that the health department is working hard and has been for a very long time and um, really appreciate all the efforts that, that you put in every day for this uh, pandemic. I know that we have all heard um, questions about how the health department is supporting the school systems of our county and uh, we did get a response uh, to that via email, but I'm hoping you can speak to that just a little bit tonight about um, how the health department is supporting the school system specifically with contact tracing um, and how we can continue to support our school systems as the demand um, for this uh, disease and contact tracing continues to grow while the schools are in full session. Thank you for that question, Supervisor Christopherson, and I'll stop my video again. Um, uh, Supervisor Dunning, did you lower your hand? Supervisor Dunning? Yes, I lowered it. Okay. Um, uh, Supervisor Dunning. Would you like me to respond to the question about schools? Oh, um, I'm sorry, I apologize. After no. your comment, your response, uh, Supervisor Crack will have the floor. Please go ahead, Lisa. Okay. Um, you did receive an email from me that was in response to, I know, some emails that all of you received, and I wanted to make sure you had some simple information about what had been um, responded to. Our work with schools is um, continuing, and we work with all Eau Claire area schools, um, Eau Claire County schools, both public and private. Um, today, for example, and every um, couple of weeks, we do a meeting with all the leadership and we walk and talk through and problem solve with them. Our process is that um, we do the disease investigation of the individual case. We work with the schools like we work with large employers and 
high risk settings to make sure we are identifying close contacts in those settings. A school, for example, really are the only ones that know which kids sit next to which kids in school, which activities children are in. Um, we can't do that work, so we count on the school identifying a close, all of the close contacts, which meet the definition of close contact. Um, and they provide to us a line list is what we call it, but a list of those close contacts. And those are the individuals that then are quarantined or need to stay home for the 14 day period, or if, if they do the shortened quarantine with a negative test um, for the shorter period of time. So every day we have a team of people doing the case investigation and then working with the schools to identify those close contacts, which they do work with us on, and then working together to make sure parents, in most cases, or staff understand um, what it means to isolate if they are a case and what it means to quarantine if they are a close contact. Um, and that work happens because um, in some cases, um, the number of close contacts is very, very high in a school setting. It is a lot of work. Um, we do work with schools also to try and support them in making policy decisions so that the number of close contacts are as few as possible in their school environments. And um, so, for example, in places where masks are worn, it's a three feet circle rather than a six feet circle around that case. Um, if a mask is not worn by both by all parties, then the circle is drawn in a larger way. That's the state and CDC mandate for close contact. So again, if, if decisions are made in a, in a school to um, make that circle um, larger because of not having mass use, we have more close contacts and more work, frankly, at a school level. Um, similarly, if schools are able to have some additional distance, if they are able to cohort, who goes to lunch, who goes to recess, how groups are together. Again, they may have many, many fewer close contacts. If those things don't happen, in some cases, we have many, many, many close contacts. Um, so there is variability from school district to school district and school building to school building about how they are able to implement their classroom and after school activities. And I know that becomes complicated, but it is, um, and it's it's difficult. We have, as you may imagine, hundreds of individuals that um, are meeting the state and federal definition of a close contact in that school environment right now. Thank you, Supervisor Crump. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the update. Um, Director Giese, I, I really appreciate it and I appreciate the information as well. Um, part of my question was answered with the school, having a, a school age son, I really appreciate the updates and just clarifying some of the information that we had received. I, I, I'm wondering too, you know, we haven't met at the courthouse at the county building for quite some time. We've been virtual, um, but I always think about our congregate settings um, right within the county, which are the jail and the juvenile detention center. And I'm wondering if there's any, if there's been any updates on cases um, within either of those settings, or if there's been a, additional opportunities maybe to do some um, testing again, if that's occurred or or not. If you could just share a little bit of that information, and where can we find um, ongoing information? on that, um, just like we see some of these updates. I'm not sure if that's on the health department website or the sheriff's department website or the CJCC, but where could one find that information ongoing? And thank you again for all your work. Thank you, Supervisor Crunk. Um, I don't have information today on um, cases related to um, those two settings, both the jail and um, juvenile detention. So I apologize that I don't have that available right now. I know at one point in time, the sheriff's department, and I don't want to speak for them, was sharing that. So um, certainly that might be a possibility, but I don't want to speak to that. Um, we do work very closely with um, the, when there is a case with any facility, including the jail and the JDC, on 
identifying that, you know, keeping that disease spread again as low as possible. And that may include testing, that may include um, really that quarantining of individuals. The jail does continue with their process, as I understand it, of um, making sure that individuals that are newly in the jail do get um, monitored for symptoms and if necessary, get tested. And I know that that is continuing. Um, we also work really closely with the jail right now on providing vaccination whenever it is requested. Um, we do take vaccine doses and make sure that individuals that are connected to the jail are easily able to be vaccinated. And that's been an enormous priority for us in that setting as well as other congregate settings. Supervisor Wilkie. Yeah, following up to Supervisor Krong's question, I can draw to her attention that monthly uh, the jail captain gives a report to judiciary and law, and I'd encourage anybody that wants to listen in on that. I don't recall the last one from memory, but we get a status in terms of uh, individuals that may or may not be infected there, as well as their efforts to continue to provide opportunities for vaccination for the inmates. Of course, we can't force it, but uh, the, the opportunities are being given there and they do utilize uh, segregation uh, of those that are infected best of their ability in a very tight uh, quarters. Uh, but uh, monthly, that's a, a routine procedure that happens at judiciary and law. Um, uh, Super, I point your attention to the chat uh, yes. response from Dave Rivestall. You have it on your screen. You should have it. I'm sorry. I heard a voice there. Who was? I speaking? can't see the chat on the phone. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. It's from Dave Rivestall. He says, in addition, testing. Sorry, I lost it here. Sorry. Chair Smyers. continues to post all drill COVID data on her website. In addition, testing still continues for all before being moved in general population. We also collaborated with City County Health on a vaccination drive last month for all incarcerated people. Uh, apologies uh, to you, uh, Supervisor Schneider. Did I hear another voice there? Was there someone else who wished to speak? You heard the Administrator Schaff, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. You did, and I was only trying to help, so I will. Okay. <laughs> All right. Were you doing the same thing in regard to chat? Yes, yes. sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions for Director Giese? Supervisor Kronk with a follow up. Uh, go ahead, uh, Supervisor Kronk. Thank you. Is there. Is there any um, anything we can do as a board to help support people that may be re-entering in the community to have a safe and healthy place to quarantine? Is there any support that you can see us as a board doing? Um, because, as you know, was put, these are people that are in our community as well and and don't necessarily stay for very long. I'm just curious if there's something we can do to be supportive, um, Director Giese, as a board. And thank you. Thank you for that question, Supervisor Kronk. Um, we do work with any individual that um, has challenges with having a safe and available spot for quarantine. If they are, um, a, and in this case, most cases, a case, um, if they are positive for COVID-19 and they are re-entering um, from the jail situation, we would carefully coordinate with the jail to make sure that they had a safe place to land. Um, we continue working um, and providing housing when people do have insecure, unsafe housing or non-available housing if they need to isolate for COVID-19 reasons, and we do continue on that. Um, right now, we have support for that, and County Board, I know through ARPA discussions, also has indicated support potentially if that's needed, if we have additional um, costs associated with that. So at this point, I think we um, have the support from County Board for that specific issue. Although outside of COVID, it's always um, an important topic. Thank you. Supervisor Russell. 
Um, thank you. I might have missed it, but um, do you have a percentage for booster shots, vaccinations? Or is that not being tracked? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question, um, Supervisor Russell. We don't have a method for tracking the percent of the population that has received a booster in a simple way right now. They are fairly new. We will likely be, the state will develop a report from the state uh, registry where immunizations land, our WER registry. Um, we're hoping that eventually we'll be able to see those third doses or booster doses, both of which would be an additional dose. Um, but at this point, we do not have that um, availability. We do know that some people are beginning to get their booster vaccine, those that are have their original series with Pfizer, and it's been six months, and they are recommended to get a booster. And it's certainly something we strongly recommend. Thank you. For the second time, Supervisor Wilkie. Uh, a follow-up to Supervisor Kronk's um, comment, uh, two things. One, getting at what she was uh, addressing was what can the board do to help uh, uh, individuals that are re-entering the community and may need to be uh, quarantined. And that I haven't got a good answer for other than, well, let's look at our federal funds that we got coming our way, ARPA funds, uh, as proposals come forward, then maybe somebody will be looking at that. But along the same line, the board can do something to help uh, with those that need to be quarantined that have to remain in the jail, which is always a challenge. They're right now looking closely at how we might be able to remodel the booking area which would uh, assist with giving us uh, more beds, 14 more beds, plus uh, help with the issue of quarantine. God forbid, but may well happen, even after we get past uh, this epi uh, pandemic, uh, we may find ourselves uh, facing that in, in future years and maybe we can be better prepared. So the board can do something up in the uh, jail to be better prepared or hopefully not another one, but if one comes. Uh, Supervisor Christofferson. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering about a statistic that we don't get to see, and I'm, I'm wondering if you can provide any insight on whether, why we don't get to see it, or, um, or if it's just difficult to trace is, positivity rate versus vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. Um, don't see this really on a county level or even on a national level. Is that something that's part of discussion or uh, just not something that is able to be traced at this time? Thank you for that question, um, Supervisor Christofferson. We do have um, at a state level data about uh, vaccinated and unvaccinated um, individuals and their cases so that I can provide that as a follow up with a website. It is not provided at a local level. The data um, is right now provided at a state level. And that's where when I was talking earlier about those individuals that um, are vaccinated are much less likely to be hospitalized and die. It's in that same location. Um, we do have vaccinated individuals getting COVID-19. That is something that we are seeing in Eau Claire and across the state in US. And again, those individuals are um, much less likely to be hospitalized and die. So that continues to be the focus of our vaccination efforts. Thank you. Before we move on to our next agenda item, I believe I'm speaking on behalf of the entire board when I express to you and your staff our very deep gratitude for your hard, consistent, and competent work on this issue. Uh, you are very much appreciated. We want you to know that and communicate that to your staff, please. I will do that and thank you. We have an amazing team and it's the team that does the work. Well, we, we know that you are working very hard also. So thank you very much. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the county administrative uh, budget recommendation. Uh, before I move to that, 
um, I want to not, uh, point out to supervisors that the budget book has been printed and is available to you and it is also online. And secondly, uh, with this, the chair refers the county administrator's budget to the Committee on Finance and Budget for its recommendations. Administrator Schaff. Are you there? Oh. I needed to unmute. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by um, expressing gratitude for all of the work that's gone into preparing this budget. Uh, it is a product of many hours of work by our department heads working with their teams, pulling them together, bringing information back to oversight committees, having dialogue about uh, future strategies. And I am simply the compiler of many of, the, many of these ideas and put them together for you to consider tonight. And so again, I come to this board with the gratitude for the work that the team has done. Our budget is made up of many different components and many different types of services. The state of Wisconsin categorizes seven different buckets of public service and all of our activities fall within those seven buckets. When we look at those buckets within the totality of our overall budget and we assign percentage of expenditure Transportation and public works is our largest component, and that is because we have not only the monies for the operations of our highway, but we also include all of the capital costs in this ex total expenditure diagram. The next area is health and social services. After that, public safety, then general government, culture and recreation, judicial, and then conservation and economic development. The we have a chart on the screen right now. This chart, as well as many other charts, are incorporated into the budget book so that you, as supervisors, can look and understand the different ways that we actually break up the numbers so that you can actually see where the monies are being invested and how they're being invested. There are a number of assumptions that go into crafting the budget document. I'm going to um, go over those revenue or assumptions, both revenue and expense briefly with you now. This budget assumed a vehicle registration fee that would increase by about 8% at 2.6 million. There is an assumption that sales tax of 11.7 million will actually be increased from the prior year by 11.6% or 1.2 million. So we are increasing over the prior year by 1.2 million. The board may recall that a very conservative stance was taken on sales tax when we compiled the 2021 budget. That is why you see a larger increase in the year to year sales tax estimate. There are some proposed increases to fees, although those fee, fees are not substantial and they are incorporated into a resolution that the board will be act or an ordinance that the board will be acting upon um, in conjunction with the budget. Our net new construction was at 2% and that's around $483,000. So our allowable levy under the law is $40,186,724. That ends up with a mill rate of $3 and around 97 cents. When we look at that from a change from the prior year, once again, we have a less than 1% change in both the levy rate and in the area of the levy amount, we actually see around a 7% change. On the expenditure side of the equation, this budget incorporates monies for the operational expenses for the sixth courtroom, 
And when you look at the different functional areas, you will see that the area of judicial has seen an increase, and that increase is due to the operations of the sixth courtroom. We were able to hold our health insurance premium increase to 8.1%. The team in human resources and also in our finance department did a lot of work with this budget, and they went to RFP for not only our health insurance, but all of the ancillary contracted services that we work through to provide benefits to our employees. And because of the work that they did, we were able to significantly reduce that cost, not only for the county, but for our employees as well. The budget recommends not only the step increases, but a 2.5% cost of living increase for employees. That number we know is, um, is still not where we'd really like it to be based on what's happening with wages within the Chippewa Valley. And that's why one of the other areas where we want to do some work is in the area of our salary matrix. And so we've assigned funding for that um, so that we can begin to adjust our salary ma matrix so it's more in line with the overall changes that we see within the Chippewa Valley and our um, area. One of the er things that we know about uh, right now about hiring and recruitment is that it is difficult and that will continue to be so. The pandemic has really created a new dynamic in the area of recruiting and there are a number of strategies that we incorporate into this recommendation that address that. The FTE count or full time equivalencies is 622.96, and that is a change of approximately 20 positions from the prior year. Continuing on, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that uh, this budget is actually funding. We made some significant organizational investments with this budget. One of the key areas is again in the area of the benefits and the wage structure that we provide to our employees. And we have a consultation that is incorporated into this. The consultation is only around $18,000, but what it will give us is a performance based uh, transformation so that we can have some of the benchmarking we need and also a strategic plan and design for our total rewards strategy. Total rewards is the way that we refer to our compensation and benefit package that we actually provide to employees. Because of the changes in addressing our healthcare affordability, again, we were able to make some changes with our cost to employees and we made a minor modification in reducing the HSA contribution only for employees on option one plans. And that is um, a continued strategy that we have been working with with resources committee on balancing the overall benefit packages. I talked a little bit about the salary matrix adjustment. Along with that, we're going to invest in taking the time to do job description updates and begin uh, realigning the organization with the uh, expectation that those who are looking for employment have when they're looking for the types of jobs that we would offer. We also are building organizational capacity with this budget. Some of the key areas that I'd like to point out, finance. In the, the area of finance, we are continuing to work to enhance internal controls one of the strategies that the finance department has deployed within the organization are finance specialists that work within each of the different departmental areas. And those specialists have added significant value, not only to our processes, but also to our ability to um, share and report out information. That continued integration and the focus on internal controls will be worked on in 2022. In the area of human resources, we're going to be rebuilding some of our basic functionality and bringing that back in-house. 
In the sheriff's department, uh, there actually was a rather creative solution applied to some of the issues that they are having with uh, correctional officers and the jail administration by creating a mechanism for the appropriate levels of supervision and backup support, as well as opportunities for correctional officers to move throughout that organization. And it provides a much needed relief for those employees. There's also a position added for detective, a detective position which works a lot on crisis response. In the area of planning and development, we've created redundancy in the emergency response function, as well as created a project position for the completion of the monumentation process. Monumentation is the survey markers that delineate the and are the basis of our descriptions of land. And then operational investments for the sixth courtroom include the Sheriff's Office, Corporation Council, the Clerk of Court and the Circuit Court, all adding positions within those areas. We take time every year to review not only what we have done in the previous year and what we want to accomplish in the coming year, but we take opportunity to review our strategic plan. Our strategic plan has three large buckets of areas where we as a county are striving for um, continuous improvement. And one is the stabilization of our county finances and operations. And you see some of that work happening where we have um, developed some of that organizational capacity. We enhance the communities and the quality and equity of citizens' lives. And we've begun much of that work with our internal justice, equity, diversity and inclusion initiatives, as well as this budget includes um, the work that we will begin to do with our community. And we're positioning our county for economic development. Some of the areas where we have examples of consistency with that strategic plan are in the area of capital planning and a long term plan that aligns with the debt structure looking at our property master plan and continuing to work that for the county as a whole, including our highway, parks, and our government center. We have a continued focus on building the systems that support our government operations. Cybersecurity is more important than ever, and our IT infrastructure and our technology solutions are what keep our operation running. And so, there is an investment in those again in the 2022 budget, as well as a continued focus on process automation. Last year, the board um, approved the use of NeoGov Learn, and so we are working through developing the curriculum in house for that system. And so that's continuing to be developed in 2022. And our sustainability um, being led within the area of our planning and development department is looking for ways in which um, we can continue to invest in practices that are consistent with that strategic initiative. And you'll see that in the budget with electric vehicle charging stations, as well as uh, some investments in automation that allow us to uh, get more work done with um, with more automated functionality. Our community need that we respond to, respond to it in many areas in our transportation and public works. We continue again to improve our PACER rating and have become very close to reaching that PACER rating of six and maintaining that. In conservation and economic development, we continue to protect our natural assets and are working on the partnerships that we have with Lake Districts. We also support uh, local economic development and there was an increase in that request this year and that increase is so that the county is supporting the Economic Development Corporation at the same level that the City of Eau Claire does as a partner within, as a community partner. 
We are working in the health and social service areas to address wait lists. And that is in a number of different areas and also in the area of um, providing services to our veterans, our aging and disabled. There are supports created for all of those areas within this budget. One of the key things that I think is coming out of this area this year is the interagency partnerships that are being formed with law enforcement and with our school districts for both mental health and crisis response. In the area of public safety, the key community need is the additional detective to work within the community and the bailiff who offers the safety within the courts infrastructure. In the judicial area, we built the capacity necessary for the sixth courtroom. And in the general government area, we have staffing that is responsive to ensure that building permits are timely done, surveys, emergency response, we have developed additional online records availability, expanded GIS, the incident command um, function will be expanded and emergency response, additional in-house attorney time and a focus on customer service. In the area of culture and recreation, we continue with our partnership with Extension and that program continues to provide education to our agricultural partners as well as our youth and families and we also made some significant investments in this budget into our parks infrastructure the county um, provides some preventative programming some of that is provided by partnerships that we have with our community members and so those are listed um, here as well we also continue to work in the area of nutrient management for the protection of our land and water. In the area of health, one of the programs that we haven't heard a lot about lately because of COVID is the Nurse Family Partnership that supports early childhood development and the work that our public health team does on the community indicators of health that are designed to early on address potential health hazards that affect our community. We also have some earlier interventions built into this budget in the area of human services, in child welfare, crisis services. And then with our Criminal Justice Collaborating Council, we have a focus on adult restorative justice, trauma-informed approaches that are going to help prevent and um, prevent further incarcerations, hopefully, but also allow for engagement and earlier law enforcement intervention interventions that are positive. And the peer support and the mentoring along with root cause analysis that's currently being done by the CJCC holds promise for uh, a more proactive approach to working with our constituency. Our capital budget is comprised mostly of our technology infrastructure, vehicle replacement, and the basic infrastructure maintenance um, necessary to run our buildings. We did budget for additional highway funding and some automation and sustainable practices. There is a focus this year on essential parks upgrades. One of the things that you will see as you're looking at the budget documents is that we do incorporate the additional ARP monies that we have available. Um, not all of the detail on how they will be spent, but we have um, indicated that we will be using that for potentially some of our capital investment um, as we move forward. As far as new debt, 14.8 million is the recommended amount in the budget. But again, we assume that some portion of that will be funded by ARPA and will not require um, additional borrowing. Our debt service levy is at 15.9 million and the debt service remains at around 9% of the overall budget. The timeline for activities and ways left to engage in the budget process. Tonight you're seeing the recommended budget. The Finance and Budget Committee is going to be meeting on October 7th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m and they will have a wrap up and discussion of potential amendments that they will be bringing back to the board. All board members are able to participate in the budget amendment process. The forms are online and they are all, you can also get them 
paper copy, or if you desire, um, you can also simply call either administration or finance and we will be happy to assist you if you would like to propose a budget amendment. The due date that we have for budget amendments is October 22nd. We will compile them, put them into the budget packet. The, um, the public hearing of the budget is on October 19th and the final adoption is on the November 2nd and 3rd of 2021. And again, all of our documents and all of these materials are either found in the book that was given to County Board Supervisors or it is also available to you online in electronic form. Thank you. Thank you, Administrator Shaw. Uh, we're not going to be having a detailed discussion of budget. Uh, you have the presentation in front of you. You do have the budget book available to you. And I'm sure we will have many occasions in the next week or two or three or four to uh, ask questions and receive answers. So I'm going to proceed now to our next budget, excuse me, to our next item, uh, presentation of petitions, claims, and so on. Uh, we have received a rezoning request from owner and applicant Anderson Trust Trustees Lauren Anderson and Emily Anderson for the town of Brunswick, which will be referred to a future meeting. Next item on our agenda under first reading of ordinances by committees from the Committee on Finance and the Budget, File 49. I'm going to ask the clerk to read the whole thing. It's rather complicated. Kirk McDonald. All right. Yes. An ordinance to amend section 4.14.001B of the code daily juvenile detention rate established to amend section 4.30.080 of the code planning and development publications photocopies digital data on cd-rom and paper copies from plotter to amend section 4.35.090 n and o of the code permit variance rezoning special exemption sign and land use fees to amend section 4.35.092 of the code Shoreland Protection Overly District Fees. To amend section 4.35.095 of the code, airport zoning fees. To amend section 4.35.170 of the code, property addressing fee. To amend section 15.01.110 of the code, permit fees. To amend section 16.30.040 of the code, fees and charges. To amend section 16. Point, oops, he's in charge. To amend section 16.33.020 of the code, rental rates for private, other, other organizations and individuals. To amend section 16.33.030 of the code, payment of rents and deposits. Thank you. Motion. This is on for first reading, Bates. Chair Smyer. Sorry? This is on for Smyer, first this reading. This is first reading. Oh, sorry. Apologies. And the, Thank and you the for code, doing. the uh, chair Smyer. Yes. Uh, the code specifically says that this is to be voted on the second meeting of October. Thank you for that reminder. Always doing your job. Thank you. Uh, next. So this is referred to next reading. Uh, next item under item ten: reports of standing committees, committees, commissions, and boards under two point oh four point one. Six zero and second reading of ordinances from the highway committee file 44. A resolution authorizing a change to the employee policy manual 519 creating section 4.2 that authorizes a shift deferential for highway department employees required to work overnight on state highway projects. Thank you. Uh, motion. One soul moves. I'm sorry, who was that? Supervisor Gatlin? Yes. Gatlin moves. Second? Schroffnagel. Second by Supervisor Schroffnagel. Thank you. Um, explanation, um, Supervisor Chilson? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this resolution actually 
Uh, on tonight's agenda, it is under highway and it applies to the highway, but it actually amends the HR policy uh, 519. And so with that in mind and uh, the resolution, the vote on the on the next page, I will actually turn it over to Supervisor Beckfield, the chair of the committee, and he can go through uh, uh, the facts of this for HR 519. Okay, has this, uh, Supervisor Beckfield, has this been reviewed by the Committee on Human Resources? It has. Okay, it's over to you then. Uh, we met on this topic a couple of weeks ago. I think the recommendation originally was a uh, dollar an hour. We discussed that it went to two dollars an hour. Uh, there was discussion of greater dollars than that because it's all uh, paid reimbursed by the state. Um, and therefore, whatever that dollar amount would be, I had have had discussions with um, uh, number of members of the highway uh, management. Uh, the $2 an hour, I guess, is, is um, acceptable. Uh, and, and no one's arguing it's up to us. But again, this would be no effect on the levy. Uh, it is an opportunity to pay our employees more. I would be more in favor of a higher rate because it's because the state is requiring um, a lot more night shift work and of course a lot of snow plows and things in order to make the highways look good and everything and operate properly you need to work at night. So um, me personally, I was in favor of a higher rate, but I believe the rate that was settled on was $2 an hour uh, increase for those differential hours working on state projects. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Coffey. Supervisor Coffey, see your hand raised. That's better. Okay. I was <laughs> muted, sorry. Uh, Supervisor Beckfield, thank you for your report. And I have a question about the state. Um, I understand that you would like to have it higher. I think in some ways that is a good idea. And does this does the state have a guideline? Are they just saying, well, well just decide whatever's fair and then we'll pay it? Or how are... <laughs> What guidelines do you have from the state and will the money continue or is it is it always covered higher or is it just for this year? No, it, it is a, it's a continuation. Um, my understanding is whatever that rate. And, uh, I, I understand that our administrator and the HR director both uh, did some studying on that and that was the range to which that it was in. But again, uh, I have no issue with paying our help work at midnight one two three four in the morning working on highway projects to make more money uh, i'd like to ask administrator administrator shop to chip in on that if you wouldn't mind administrator shop thank you um as supervisor Beckfield indicated um the department of transportation um and it uses guidelines that are actually um, for night shift work that are based on federal and state guidelines. And it's related to transportation prevailing wage, pro wage projects. And it's around 7.5% to a 10% increase of the employee's wage that is added to the, um, to the shift for that shift differential. And that is why the $2 amount is the amount that is being recommended. Supervisor Gatlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to add that um, the shift differential is per project. So we, the highway department is able to estimate what projects they, they do estimate the projects they know the projects that they're going to do ahead of time way ahead of time and they work closely with the state the wisconsin counties highway association on um on these kinds of issues with what the state rate is so it's not necessarily when they work overtime to plow the snow it's when there's a project going on and they have to work on the road mostly for safety they have to work i think it's uh four in the morning um or yeah, like four in the afternoon to six in the morning, I believe, when they're working at that time when there's less traffic. So 
it makes sense that they would get uh, additional dollars to their uh, rate wage. But I have a question as to, does this lock us in at $2 an hour? I don't recall in either committee where we discussed a dollar amount or this percentage. So this fact sheet kind of laid some new details on it for me. And I'm on the HR committee and I'm on the highway committee. So yeah, Administrator mm -hmm. Schaff will help us out there. Um, it's actually in the fact sheet as well as the resolution where it discusses what the amount um, is. And so that was the amount that was discussed from based on those federal and state prevailing wage guidelines. So it's but my also, question was, are we going to be locked in, say, from, you know, in eight, three or four years from now when the wages are higher? Are we still going to be in that same seven and a half to 10 percent higher? No, you can actually we could because, as you mentioned, it is project by project. We can amend the employee policy manual to adjust okay. that so that it's consistent with what we're seeing in wages. And this manual tends to be pretty fluid anyway, correct? Yes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Wilkie. I'm just curious if I'm hearing correctly, uh, the state's okay with us going with the $3. Uh, I can be corrected if I'm wrong there. If that in fact is the case, given the competitive job market right now, what is the reason why we wouldn't wanna do the $3 versus the $2? To whom are you directing the question? The commissioner or our administrator or or any of my colleagues, it, it just seems to make sense unless I can be told a reason not to do it. Administrator Schaff, I'm going to hand it to you first. And uh, um, I see that Commissioner Johnson's also on the call, so he can chime in if he. Um, I think that as they were debating about this, there is a, there are a number of different um, lifts. As Supervisor Gatlin indicated, this is only for very specific project work. It would only apply to a very few of the employees. It wouldn't be across the board. And I believe my recollection of the conversation is, is that the $2 per hour increase is enough to give an adequate increase, but still maintain a level of parity with other um, pay structures throughout the county. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson, if you are on the line, do you have a response? Yeah, so we have specific contracted projects throughout the summer mainly where every contract is different. Um, some of the contracts are our cost is totally reimbursed by the state. Some of them are performance-based management projects where we actually figure that cost into the estimate ahead of time and get reimbursed that rate. So there is there's there's no limit on what this could be. The state will pay that rate. Um, so that's where Mr. Stop is saying we looked at those comparable rates and prevailing wages. Uh, we did do a comprehensive survey with some other counties in the area and what they were doing as well. Um, so that's kind of where this rate comes from, is based upon, correct? Supervisor Wilkie? Well, uh, I give, go back to my question. Uh, why not do it and become really competitive? Uh, uh, granted, it's uh, not across the board, but uh, why wouldn't we want to pay our employees uh, at that higher end? Uh, the only reason I, I was hearing maybe is because they're going to get higher wages than maybe some of our other employees, but we got to start somewheres. I see uh, Supervisor Pagonis's hand raised. Uh, is your question relevant to this discussion? It's a paragraph relative to this discussion. When it was before the human resources, the, um, the fact sheet, which I think is consistent with the fact sheet we have for tonight, specifically states um, for overnight work contracted with the Department of Transportation, a shift differential of $2 per hour would apply to all staff workers. The hourly rate for night shift work is established by federal and state guidelines. So it, it sounds to me like it's been established outside of our purview. It would be an acceptance. I, maybe we need more research. Maybe we should pass it and then bring it back later. That's certainly an option. Uh, Supervisor Dunning. 
was wondering if we're looking at between seven and a half and 10%, at what base salary were we basing that percentage on? That was based upon our operators' um, wages, our, our hourly operator, our equipment operator's wages. And that, that is, wage. is that under $20 an hour? It, 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 the starting wage is around $20 an hour to $23 an hour is the, the spread right now per hour. Um, so um, that's where that between that two and three dollars is, is what was discussed there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, Chair Smyer. I'm sorry, who's speaking? Oh, Supervisor Beckfield. Sorry. I did put this back on our agenda for our Friday meeting on the 15th to rediscuss. So if, however you choose to, to do this, pass it, then rediscuss it in our meeting on the 15th. I'm totally good with that. Well, we have a couple options here. We can um, we can refer this back to committee. We can postpone to a time definite. The chair is open to suggestions. Administrator Shaft, do you have a suggestion? Well, I I think that there are some projects that if if we could pass this tonight, I think that there was a desire to begin paying this as soon as possible okay. uh, because the, uh, there's already projects that are slated to begin. So okay. um, I think as uh, Supervisor Pagonis has pointed out, we can pass this and if we need to, we can come back and make whatever adjustments are necessary. Uh, Commissioner uh, Johnson, would that be acceptable to you? Yes, because one of those projects are uh, nighttime repairs for concrete buckling that happened over the summer. So you'll see our crews okay. out doing concrete repairs here very soon. Okay. Overnight. So Supervisor Beckfield? Okay That's totally you? acceptable. Okay. Is there any other? Oh, uh, Supervisor Gatlin, I see your hand still raised. Did you not want to make another comment? Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. That's okay. Don't confuse the, the, the chair here. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard enough to monitor 20, 33 people here. Uh, okay. Um, any other question or discussion regarding regarding this item? Okay, supervisors, I assume that you are prepared to vote on file 44. Has there been a motion? I think there was. There's a motion on the table. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Dunning. Always reminding me. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <coughs> we'll do this yep. by voice vote. All those in favor of file 44, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed by nay. It is unanimous. Thank you. Next, from the Committee on Planning and Development, File 46. An ordinance amending the 1982 officials zoning district boundary map for the Town of Union. Uh, this is coming back to us, second reading. Motion, was that you, Supervisor Leary, waving at me? Okay, motion by Supervisor Leary. Second, second by, by, Supervisor Bates. by Bates, thank you. Um, Explanation, Supervisor Gibson. Thank you, Chair Smyer. Uh, this request was to rezone five acres of land from A1 to A2 to construct a pole shed on the residents. Uh, the Eau Claire County and the Town of Union's future land maps include this the, the property in the rural transition planning area. Uh, the staff's conclusions and recommendations were that the, they find that the proposed rezoning request substantially conforms with the Oakland yes, County Comprehensive yeah. Plan. And the Comprehensive Plan recognizes that the proposed A2 zoning district is consistent within the map future land use designation. Uh, the Town of Union Board held their public hearing regarding the proposed rezoning and recommended approval. Uh, Eau Claire County's planning development conducted their pu uh, required public hearing and uh, voted 5-0 in favor. Thank you. Questions or discussion? Uh, Supervisor Christofferson. Oh, I guess Thank not. you. Oh, no, yes. yes. Um, thank you. Yes, I was just um, 
wondering if you could comment, Supervisor Gibson, on whether there was any public comment either for or against this rezoning. Well, it's stated right here in the fact sheet that there, there were uh, no objections during the public hearing for opposal. Supervisor Christofferson? Okay, thank you. Any other question or discussion regarding this item? I hear none. Supervisors, we are now voting on file 46. All those in favor of file 46, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed by nay. It is unanimous, thank you. The next item is file 48. An ordinance amending the 1982 official zoning district boundary map for the town of Washington. This is our second reading. This is before us for a vote. Uh, motion. Motion. So yeah, moved. So moved. Second. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get on second. I didn't hear who moved. I did. Humbuck Boyle. Uh, Humbuck Boyle moves. Gatlin seconds. Um, explanation Supervisor Gibson. Okay, this request was to rezone 6.98 acres from A2 uh, District to C2 and C3 highway business to allow creation of four commercial lots. Um, the Eau Claire County and the Town of Washington's land use maps include the property in uh, RC planning er areas. The staff's conclusions and recommendations is staff finds that the proposed rezoning request substantially conforms with the Eau Claire County Comprehensive Plan, and the Comprehensive Plan recognizes that the proposed C2 and C3 zoning districts are consistent within the mapped future land use for this designation. Uh, the Town of Washington Board, they held their public hearing uh, regarding proposed rezoning and recommended approval. The uh, Eau Claire County's Planning Development conducted our required public hearing and then regarding and we voted 5-0 in favor. So oh, the committee does recommend approval of this rezoning to the county board. Thank you. Supervisor DeLuca. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm a bit confused by what was in the packet. Um, on page 28, the town of Washington narrative says they wanted C3, and the applicant on page 30 and uh, 34 and mentioned on page 30 says C2. Um, there are four uh, lots, are some C2 and some C3. I, I don't understand the discrepancy. Supervisor Gibson. Uh... I want to say from what I remember, and if there's anybody else on the committee that remembers too, that we actually rezoned it to C3 because the or Supervisor Gibson, if, if you look, this is Supervisor Coffey. One of the things that said they wanted to make sure, and that was through the town of Washington, that there was um, no double zoned property. And so I think that's why it's all zoned C3. C3, correct. Yeah, yeah, I recall yep. that as well. That's what I, that's what I was, yeah. Okay. Supervisor but, DeLuca? Um, but on page 30 in the ordinance, it doesn't mention C3, it only mentions C2. And your applicant on page 34 was only asking for C2. So I'm I'm just wanting to know which one is correct. Supervisor Gibson. <laughs> Trying to think here. I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry to put you um, on the spot there. I think my understanding, um, Supervisor Gibson, was I that go ahead. Chair Spire, I think we also have Matt Michaels with us. If he can, oh, is, if Matt's whatever. on here, yeah. that'd be wonderful. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, the chair is going to try to bring some order to the discussion here. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Michaels, uh, do you have something to offer here? 
Thank you for calling on me. So I'm trying to, sorry, trying to follow in the packet here. If you look at page, I believe it's 38, no, I'm sorry, 35 of your packet, um, what is shown is what we call a five lot CSM, certified survey map. You'll see a cul-de-sac coming off of um, Prill Road there, uh, ending in a bulb there with four lots. Those four lots are intended to be uh, eight, excuse me, C2. Um, I'm sorry, my computer's doing weird things here. Um, so those are intended to be C2 to be developed with commercial buildings. Um, to the north of that, there's a house, and then to the east of that, there's outlot one, which is also intended to be C2. The outlot would be for um, probably stormwater collection, uh, retention pond. Now, the reason for the C3, the recommendation that came forth from the town of Washington was, if you look to the west of these lots, um, we can't. We could see it on an aerial, but that's lot five. Lot five contains the existing um, Chippewa Valley growers greenhouses. So if you're familiar with that facility, there's some of it's open to the public. Anyway, the gentleman who owns that, what he wishes to do is take a portion of the property that's before you tonight that's shown as being connected now to lot five and include that in lot five for future expansion of the greenhouse area, the Chippewa Valley growers. Now, in order to do that, now the existing zoning on what we call lot five on this picture is C3. And so in order to, someone mentioned, avoid a double zoned lot, if you will, meaning that it's one lot that has two zoning districts, which becomes a challenge or a problem for us. Um, at the request uh, actually of staff, the town made that recommendation to rezone that C3. Um, and that recommendation then was carried forward to the Planning and Development Committee when it went before them and was recommended for approval from them. Um, so that's how we got to this point. Would that make it necessary to make any change in the in the file as of as it is? That's in front what of I'm us? wondering about now that it's brought up. Um, and, and I appreciate uh, folks who <laughs> who take the time and trouble to look at these packets. I know they're voluminous. Um, looking at the ordinance, it should it should have a reference to the C3 area. Um, so honestly, I'm not sure I didn't see this packet before it was put put out. So if it's not there, um, recommending that C3, it should be. So that's something that would need to be um, adjusted. Might it be advisable to do a postpone to the next meeting for this item so that a correction can be made? Yes. It's in the fact sheet of C3 in the heading. Yeah, you're right. I'm um, just going to say the same sure thing, the, Robin. We have to make sure the file itself is correct. Yeah, the actual ordinance that's adopted by the county board should be should be correct to that recommendation of C3 as well. So, yeah. Should right. we? <laughs> would it be correct for the chair to look for a motion to postpone decision on this item to the next meeting? I, I believe Chair Smyer it already says C3 as stated. Wait, though, when you get to the ordinance, it still says C2. Right. Oh, the ordinance page, itself. Page 30. It's the ordinance that must be correct. Right. So, Supervisor Leary, were you making the motion to postpone? Love to postpone this till our next meeting so we can make the correction. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there a second? DeLuca seconds. Luca seconds. Is there any discussion right. of the motion to postpone? Um, I see, well, I saw Supervisor mm -hmm. Coffee's hand raised, but <laughs> she just took it down. <laughs> so I'm assuming we can vote on this, a motion to postpone this item to the next meeting. All those in favor of the motion to postpone, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed by nay. It is unanimous. Thank you. The next you. item is file 51. An ordinance amending the 1982 official zoning district boundary map for the town of Lincoln. Motion. So move. Supervisor Bates, are you moving that? Yes. Motion by Bates. Second. 
second by Leary. Okay. You folks, you can't rely on waving at me all the time. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, I did see that. So uh, is there any, oh, I'm sorry, explanation, Supervisor Gibson? <laughs> Hey, we'll get through it tonight. Yet, Hopefully this one ain't as confusing. But, uh, this one is very similar to actually the first one. This is to rezone five acres of land from A1 to A2 district so that they can construct a pole shed on the residents. Uh, both the county and the town's land, future land use maps both include the properties in their rural uh, planning area. Uh, staff's conclusions and recommendations were that staff finds the proposed rezoning uh, request conforms with the Eau Claire County Comprehensive Plan, and the Comprehensive Plan recognizes that the proposed A2 zoning district is consistent uh, within the mapped future land use. Uh, the Town of Lincoln, they held their public hearing and voted to recommend uh, Eau Claire County's plan and development. We conducted our public hearing and we voted 5-0 in favor. Thank you. Supervisor DeLuca, is your hand raised for this item? Yes. Go ahead, please. Um, do we have to have a motion and a second before we discuss, or? We have. I think oh, we, we have? already have that. It's oh, on okay. the floor, yes. Okay, um, so this might not be an issue. It might just be a typo on page 40. Um, this property is in the town of Lincoln, but it says that the town of Washington board recommended approval. <laughs> so I was just, you know, Matt, to... we, didn't, we, we had that same thing. That same thing was brought up at our uh, planning and development meeting. And Matt, you were supposed to have corrected that. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, there's no shaming of staff going on. Here, got... so. <laughs> well, this is why we need more staff. <laughs> what is, what is the correct statement, like Supervisor that. Gibson? <laughs> it's totally like to say that's an Easter egg that we planted in there just to see if anyone noticed. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> so the job, I think. Oh, I oh yeah, I guess. So. so, what is the correction? Town of Lincoln instead of Town of Washington. Okay, we'll do. We'll do yeah. that as a as a typo and proceed. Any other comments, yeah. Supervisor? It's a typo. No, that's the only comment I had. Thank right. you. Any other question or discussion regarding this item? Okay, Supervisors. I assume we are ready to vote on File Fifty One. All those in favor of file 51, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed by nay. I hear none. Uh, thank you. The, the motion passes. Next from the Committee on Finance and Budget, file 60. A resolution authorizing the sale of tax deed property to Richard and Janie Hopkins, legal heirs of the former owners, James B. and Marlene R. Hopkins. For $23,065.66. Directing Corporation Council to prepare a quick claim deed on the described property and directing the county clerk to execute said quick claim deed on behalf of Eau Claire County. A motion to approve 212260 by Supervisor Wilkie. Second, by Supervisor Wilkie, second by Shrafnago. Shrafnago, thank you. Uh, explanation, uh, Supervisor Pagonis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this passed in finance and budget uh, five to zero. This is similar to one we had recently, I'd say at the last meeting, um, where we are required if the current owners wish to pay all of the outstanding, <clears throat> excuse me, taxes and penalties and interest, then they could um, then regain a claim of their of the property. In this case, it's not the former owners, but the heirs of the former owners, but it falls within the same uh, county code and st same state statute that requires the county, if the former owners wish to have it, and as long as they pay the, the full amount, then it's um, deeded back to them. So that's where we are with this one. Thank you. Any questions or discussion regarding the file? Backfield with question. Supervisor Backfield. So it'll it'll remain in the family. We're just doing the paperwork on this thing. Basically, is that how I understand it, Supervisor? We're collecting the we're collecting the twenty three thousand sixty five dollars and sixty six cents. And Chair okay. Smyers, a reminder: this needs to be a roll call vote. Thank you, as usual, Supervisor Bergonis. Okay, 
Any other question or discussion regarding this file? We will proceed, sorry, we will proceed to a roll call vote on file 60. Clerk McDonald. Supervisor Gibson. Aye. McKinney. Aye. Knight. Yes. Agonis. Aye. Anton. Yes. Zook. Yes. Filson. Yes. Felgis. Oh, not here. Mowry. Aye. Coffee. Yes. Bates. Aye. Russell. Yes. Gatlin. Aye. Meyer. Yes. Hambuck Boyle. Aye. Neiman. Aye. Dunning. Aye. Wilkie. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Beckfield. Yes. Snyder. Yes. Leary. Aye. DeLuca. Aye. Jansen. Yes. Rothnagel. Yes. Roberts. Yes. Kronk. Yes. Supervisor Kronk. Yes. She, yes. she said yes. yes. Okay. And Christofferson. Aye. You say yes also, Supervisor Christofferson? She did say yes. Yes. All right. Okay. So we have 26 yes. That's okay. a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Uh, supervisors, we have reached the end of our agenda. We are now adjourned. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and Eau Claire County.